Be gone, vile man! Be gone from me! The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 291. It is our post Royal Rumble Week show. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we really do <laughs> have so much to talk about this week. Yes, maybe, I don't know, this is way up there, the list of, of so much to talk about. And as always, so many things we can't talk about uh, right here on the first and still the only wrestling podcast. That's right. This is one of the more highly anticipated shows for both of us <laughs> in quite some time. I mean, you do 291 of these things, and sometimes it can get a little blase, a little routine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not this time. It's not every week that Vince McMahon fires his own son for screwing <laughs> up the Royal Rumble. <laughs> I just, I just, I could watch like a movie. I could, I could read like <laughs> 10 books about like that 48 hour period. Because as we understand it, Shane was already at this point coming into the Royal Rumble weekend factored in for Elimination Chamber and WrestleMania. Sure. He, he shows up to the building on Saturday with Nick Khan, Vince's new favorite son. Yes. There is currently kind of a power vacuum. They fired a lot of agents and producers. There's a space where Shane could finally ascend to to being like a figurehead in this company again at least on like the television production side of things sure and so his first big chance is that he's gonna he's gonna take charge of the royal rumble it's about drive it's about power and (laughs) and what should happen but not only is the is the match a disaster it's very boring uh, the big surprises are Bad Bunny, which he apparently embarrassed Vince McMahon by changing where Bad Bunny was going to come into the match several times. And then he also built it around himself. Yes. <laughs> Coming in very late and staying in till the very end and then eliminating and tra- tra- trading blows with real professional former mixed martial artist Matt Riddle and eliminating Kevin Owens and then sandbagging Brock Lesnar because he was too gassed to get over the top rope. (laughs) And it was such a disaster. And Vince was unhappy and Brock Lesnar was unhappy. And I guess bad bunny was unhappy. (laughs) And then 24 hours later, Shane McMahon is not an elimination chamber. He's not going to WrestleMania and he may not even be with the company, even as a talent anymore. (laughs) Quite a fall from grace. Like that is a land speed record. Like at least Triple H's downfall took place over like six months and he had a heart and he can at least fall back on the fact that he had a heart attack too. Sure. Shane McMahon. (laughs) That's just a land speed record of seemingly finding an opening to get back in to to re-win your father's love after all this time to him personally telling you to go home and don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> so many layers to that story as well. The He was put in the Pat- Patterson role of booking the Rumble. It's like the third year he's he's been put in that role ever since Well, Pat passed away. But before Pat passed away, Pat was maybe not doing well mentally. Mm-hmm. And not able to fill the role that he had filled for years and years, even after he quit the company <laughs> in 2004, when he told Vince he was pushing Triple H too much. But um, yeah, so Shane comes in, he's going to produce the Rumble. And then as the story goes, reported by m- many sources, the day of the show, he keeps laying out the match and Brock Lesnar and Vince McMahon keep vetoing his ideas. And then Shane apparently went on a bit of a power trip and was mean to people (laughs) while he was (laughs) while he was booking the match, perhaps as a result of getting overruled by his dad and Brock Lesnar. And the end result is Shane McMahon was the next to last elimination in the Royal Rumble. (laughs) 
the next to last elimination in the Royal Rumble was Shane McMahon. The last elimination was Drew McIntyre. And then uh, Brock Lesnar won the thing. Yeah. And then Shane's going home. So Shane was going to be, he's going to, he was going to wrestle Seth Rollins at WrestleMania. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he was going to be in the Elimination Chamber uh, WWE Championship match at what uh, WWE Lonnie Donegan, whatever the name of the show <laughs> is here in a couple of weeks at the, in Saudi Arabia. And now he's not. So, okay. That's it. That's you, Shane. <laughs> We don't recall. Yes, it's so long. Good luck. Now I don't recall saying good luck. He's he's <laughs> going. Yeah, it's it is fat. Like the whole Shane dynamic from him leaving the company in whatever that was, two thousand nine, to go try to do his own thing in China. Was it? He was trying to like get pay per view yes. as a concept off the ground. Correct in, in a country that didn't really do it, and. That obviously didn't go super well. And he came back and like, there's never been a time of at least officially, obviously, as you said, he's been in sort of a, a role of helping book the rumble for the last couple of years, but he's never had like an official creative or executive role in the company since he's come back, despite what that one guy from sports <laughs> illustrated said. Yes. Um, so it, it, this is all just so fascinating. fascinating that they would turn to him. I don't know. It was like, was he seen as like Pat's protege? I guess. I don't know. I don't understand the thought process there, frankly. Like, um, if I, if you were to ask me, like, who are some great ring psychologists? Who are some great guys known for coming up with great finishes? I would say Pat Patterson. I would not say Shane McMahon. <laughs> but we we just don't have a lot of. You know, Shane was a guy who was there in the late 80s working as a referee and stuff and around the office and around Pat. So maybe Vince just saw it as a, as a continuity thing there. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, guess, I guess that would be interesting. Yeah, maybe last year, two years ago, whatever the first year, maybe he just had like a really good one, like really good idea that Vince really liked a couple of years ago. So like, all right, we'll bring Shane in to, you know, to give his thoughts on the rumble each year now and then. He, yeah, there was reports of him. And also just, I also imagine, so they, there was also a report that TJ Wilson, Tyson Kidd was not there for right. some reason, a reason that was related to the Royal Rumble, which sounds to me like he was trying to get cleared, but that's, I haven't seen that reported directly anywhere. Yeah, it's just speculation, but I think it's pretty, it's pretty sound speculation. Mm-hmm. So for every reason, TJ Wilson, who's, you know, not only been booking a lot of a lot of the, the best women's matches, but also a lot of the you know more celebrated men's matches. And I guess would have had a hand in probably both of the rumbles if he was there. For sure. Um, the women's rumble. Because mm-hmm. I know I know I read that they they brought up uh, Finley to do the win- to help with the women's match, um, which we'll, we'll maybe get to that <laughs> a little bit later. Um, yes. But. Yeah, but the men's match itself, it's whatever whoever else is there. So if it's maybe Finley was helping with that too. I know Jamie Noble is there. Uh he he was named in several of the reports of people that were at odds with Shane over things. <laughs> and it's like just imagine being those guys whose job it is to lay this stuff out, who already probably have to walk around on eggshells anyway, because they work for an insane man whose brain is made of soup. And then all of a sudden his fat headed son shows up and it's like, all right, fellas, I'm taking charge now. And you have to listen to me. Cause I, my dad said, so like, just imagine being like one of the regular agents having to deal with that. You're probably already stressed and overworked. If one of your regular coworkers isn't there. And now Vince's large adult son is coming in to try to tell you how to do your job. Yes. Must be incredibly frustrating. It must be. Uh, let's so we can finish talking about the rumble here. Uh, zero matches on, on a one hour kickoff show which I only saw a few minutes of by accident <laughs> only so much you know Jerry Lawler JBL Peter Rosenberg Booker T I can take I like Booker saying shucky ducky quack quack <laughs> though he's he can yeah he has his moments on those shows but when it's it's an hour of Kayla with all of those guys you mentioned and the 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 Irish or Scottish guy or whatever he is. Yes. Who's Kevin the... Kevin Donegan. Yes. <laughs> I, who I'm sure is also a perfectly fine in that role, but there's both of them were on that panel for some reason. I don't think you need two of those people. 
Um, and then, yeah, you have all of the, the quote unquote legends and Peter Rosenberg um, just talking for an hour and thrown into video packages. Sounds, sounds like a dreadful hour of television. And I was quite happy to skip that. Having to use WWE speak and, and talk in kayfabe for an hour is mm. an, an enviable task. <laughs> yeah. Um, your, your friend Renee, I think has a story that she told not too long ago about how she like called Tyson Fury one of his nicknames, but it wasn't the nickname Vince wanted her to her. She use. called him the Gypsy King instead of the lineal world champion or whatever. Right. And apparently that was <laughs> that was like such an oversight that during, while the video package was airing, Vince screamed in her ear for like a minute straight about how she'd ruined everything and answer yes. me, God damn it, and all this stuff because <laughs> because she had called him one of his other nicknames instead of the lineal champion. Yes. So yeah, it sounds like a nightmare for the people involved and for anyone that was uh, foolish enough to watch it. Sure. The Royal Rumble show opened with Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns. <laughs> Seth Rollins beat Roman Reigns by disqualification in a match where the Usos were banned from ringside. Roman Reigns kept the universal title. If you would ask me, they had a good match with a, with, a, with a finish that was so bad that if you would ask me to come up with a bad finish, I don't think I could have come up with one this bad. <laughs> yeah, it would have taken a little bit of thought to for me to come up with something this dumb. Um, it's also just so funny because it's such an own goal where it's like, okay, we don't want to beat Seth clean. Okay, yes. well, you you chose to do a stipulation where the guys who always run in and help Roman are banned. Right. Like no one forced you to do that. So you book, you did a stipulation telling people, hey, you're going to get a finish this time, a clean finish because the Usos can't run in to cost the, the, the other guy to match. And then right. you just didn't do a finish anyway. So yeah, just a good, good encapsulation of, of how WWE uses stipulations and uh, the absolute contempt that they have <laughs> for their viewing audience. Women's Royal Rumble was up second. And Ronda Rousey came back and won the thing. They had to fly in a makeup artist <laughs> to do Ronda's makeup. Was she funny or something? I, I don't feel like I should comment on any of this. <laughs> so then they had a match that both both Rumples were lacking in, in excitement and action. Mm -hmm. And the participants in both Rumples, for the most part, didn't seem to understand the fundamental points of making a battle royal exciting, which are when a new person enters the match, everyone currently in the match takes a bump for the person who just entered the match. And also, while there's X number of people doing the, oh, don't throw me out. Oh, I'm going to throw you out. No, oh, I'm going to throw you out struggles against the ropes. There should be two people in the middle of the ring doing a spot that's exciting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nobody understood that apparently not although considering some of the names that were in this maybe not ask maybe ask not trying to have them do a bunch of a bunch of spots was maybe a maybe that was a bright call that's now again that's an own goal because they chose to not use people like say io shirai or raquel gonzalez they chose to throw Sasha Banks out like six minutes into the match. <laughs> so like your, your good workers, Rhea and Bianca were in there for a while and Natty it, was in there for a while. So you had a few people that were, are at least, you know, are good or at least competent, but it's three of them. And then you got a parade of God bless her, Kelly Kelly's and Cameron and, <laughs> Michelle McCool and a bunch Oksana of people. Sana came back. That's true. Yeah, I completely forgot. <laughs> For her first wrestling appearance in, in eight years. She just peaced out and came back for this. What a <laughs> yeah. What a feather in her cap. But uh Summer Ray, who screamed the F word on her way to the ring, that was really <laughs> funny. Highlight of the show, probably Summer Ray yelling the F word as she ran down the ramp. Yeah, that was pretty great. Um uh, Alicia Fox, I thought concussed Natalia, but I guess Natalia's okay. Um, <laughs> hard to say. They, Natalia did more stuff in the match, so she either wasn't hurt or she worked hurt for the rest of that thing. But yeah, I think she worked. I think she worked hurt. 
Um, I, and I think it was pretty clear she got she got knocked silly. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, that that was one of the only times where of all people with when everyone ran up to do spots, it was when Alicia Fox came in. <laughs> Yes. And uh, and then, yeah, you had you had the Bellas come out and you had, as you mentioned, you had Rhonda come out and they, they threw everybody out. And then it was just Rhonda and Charlotte and Rhonda threw Charlotte out. And look at credit. Rhonda got a really big reaction. And I don't know what it'll be like on television going forward where we may have some sort of idea based on that raw. But um, as far as what you know, what we talked about last week of her coming in as a heel or a baby face or whatever, we'll I'm sure that'll the dust will settle on that in the next week or two. But um, she did not look particularly good as far as her in ring work. Um, and she did not look thrilled to be there. <laughs> and but and- it got a big reaction. But then the, and and the sign set on fire. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Her reaction on Raw the next night, aside from whatever noise they piped in, was nothing. It was just nothing. They put her out there with Becky Lynch, and there was just nothing. So um, maybe it's because all these, all of the women that Ronda is feuding with are are heels, mm-hmm. and Ronda has made it pretty clear that she is also going to be a heel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. It's like, who, who am I supposed to be emotional? Who emotionally, who am I supposed to be rooting for here? Uh, I guess it'll be a baby face Charlotte. That always works. It's always great. Always <laughs> super likable in that type of role. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Like it was, it was that, that segment on raw. I mean, we're just kind of going all over the place here, but since it's related to the end of this match, yeah, yeah it's you know, people, I'm... people still don't want to, <laughs> People still don't want to boo Becky and they don't want to cheer Rhonda. Also, Rhonda had a lot of weird WWE verbiage that she did not deliver well. And so the crowd just sort of sat there quietly. And and then Lita came out. And I'll tell you what, Lita, who was both in the Rumble and in uh, and on Raw the next night, uh, never thought of her as like a particularly good promo. But after that, Rhonda <laughs> sounded like sounded like, you know, uh, prime, Nin- yeah, prime dusty out there. Like, yes, 1999 Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> that's right. So, you know, I guess that's that's something that Rhonda is, uh, is helping. It's helping us appreciate <laughs> other people who are better at their jobs than she currently is. Yeah. So, just in tying up the uh, putting a bow tie on the just a bow, not a bow tie, putting a bow on the women's rumble. I don't think Lita did a moonsault in the rumble. She teased it. I don't think she delivered it. Correct. Yes, she she went up for it, and then Rhea pushed her down, and I think that led to her elimination a few uh, a few seconds later. Yeah, last time Lita did a moonsault, I was scared, so I was kind of glad. I know she's been doing them uh, in training. Uh, I know, but <laughs> I guess I guess we'll see here at, on this. She's on the Saudi show, wrestling Becky Lynch. I guess we'll see if she has another moonsault in her, or if that's a good idea. So, yeah, so Ronda won the Women's Rumble, which went longer than the Men's Rumble. As you mentioned, Ronda Rousey's pyro for winning the Women's Royal Rumble set the WrestleMania sign on fire during the during the Royal Rumble show. And so Becky Lynch's match, which was up next against Dewdrop, uh, they evacuated the area where the plastic from the sign was melting and falling on people. They evacuated that area. And we're repairing the sign and such while that match was going on. I'm not sure if that match would have had a ton of reaction anyway, because I think both Becky and Dewdrop are heels. But, <laughs> but uh, not fine, not great work, and not great crowd response for uh, Becky Lynch's match against Dewdrop. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't think there's anything wrong with the match other than the fact that, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Dewdrop's trying to work like the big powerhouse heel role, but also Becky's supposed to be a heel. So nobody, you know, the end result was that nobody really cared. Also, I think the biggest problem, maybe because you could also argue that Seth and Roman were both heels in the opener and the crowd was very into that. So I think the biggest problem was 
Not a single person in that building thought there was any chance Dewdrop was going to win, nor did they think of her as a star anywhere approaching Becky's level. So uh, I think that's like between all of that and the crowd and the sign and all of that, that's, that's a million reasons why nobody cared about this. Yep. And Bobby Lashley beat Brock Lesnar for the WWE title when Paul Heyman turned on Brock and went with Roman. Roman cost Brock the WWE championship. I like Paul going back with Roman. That's an interesting twist. Yeah, I think I was maybe a little surprised to see it paid off this soon. I kind of thought maybe this was like the mania finish mm-hmm. was was going to be Heyman uh, turning on Brock, but they, they did it here. So, um, yeah, and that's we predictable isn't always bad. Like we, we talked about it. Um, we kind of laid out this exact, not this exact scenario, but kind of this exact scenario last week that that Brock was going to lose due to Roman and then win the rumble. And then they're going to be off to the races for that mania match. So yeah, I mean, this, this is a, as good of a way as I could think of to get to another Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, WrestleMania. Uh, Edge and Beth beat Miz and Maurice. Totally fine for its role. Thought it was a good eight minute match that went 17 minutes. Yep, and then uh, Brock Lesnar won the Royal Rumble in a finish. I think everybody saw it coming. Yeah, I mean, as as we talked about last week, they intentionally, if it appeared, did not make anyone feel like they were ready. The only person that it felt like when they came out that there was the slightest bit of juice, at least as far as crowd reaction and stuff go to, Drew McIntyre came back as something of a surprise. He had been off TV with a, with a neck injury for like the last month. and Yeah, and the word is he's still... He's still injured, but he won't be working house shows. He'll just be working TV. <laughs> that's like that's like 2010 Cena, right? That's like there was a there was a stretch where Cena was like really really banged up, but he was still working like every Raw and pay per view, and they just like were ha- having... it never ends well. <laughs> yeah, especially because like Drew ain't making John Cena money. I bet like ain't no reason to put yourself through that if you if you if time off and getting healthy would be would be better for you like you're gonna come back to do what to wrestle baron corbin at wrestlemania or sheamus baron. again or somebody yeah looks that way uh ridge holland or lonnie down again or whatever mm-hmm, mm-hmm, his name mm-hmm. is yeah Ugh. yeah so good good luck to drew like i mean it was nice to see him back because i i mean the way they were talking about that neck injury they started talking about spinal stuff that yeah, that makes you nervous like that makes you you know concerned if you'll ever see that guy you know or how how long this guy has left at all so uh, good to see that he was packing under a month but also maybe maybe take some more time off yes so on raw we talked about the ronda stuff we talked about lita stuff we talked about we did not talk about Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar came back and said that he is going to uh, win the WWE title at uh, the Elimination Chamber in Saudi Arabia, and then he's going to wrestle Roman Reigns in a title for title match. The way they keep bringing up title for title makes me think that maybe that's what that match is going to be. They could what certainly do it. do it, like I, I, because again, if you don't, who the heck is left for Bob Lashley to wrestle? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Like uh, Seth Rollins. Yeah, Owens. Uh, it's like it's the same guys. Big E is apparently back on SmackDown and in a tag team again. Yeah, they so just they never they never really explained that or paid it off. It was just like, hey, Big E is officially back on SmackDown. Like, why? <laughs> can you can you make curious. up a trade or something? Yeah, they, they could. They just don't. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it's like, yeah, your guys that you have left that they have any sort of regular television time are, you know, it's Lashley, it's Owens and it's Seth. So you might as well do title for title with Brock and Roman, because it's like, I guess you could do like a three way with Seth and Seth and Bob and Owens or Seth versus Bob. But that doesn't feel particularly that feels like, I don't know, I guess that could be an opening match on one of the two nights of stupendous WrestleMania. Yes. The most stupendous two-night WrestleMania in history. 
and it's tremendous. God knows we've seen our fair share of stupendous two nights uh, of WrestleMania, but this will be the most stupendous. Yeah. So it looks like on SmackDown this week, they'll make Ronda and Charlotte official for WrestleMania. <laughs> Not the direction. I... And they're going. And uh, yeah, any other uh, uh, NXT 2.0 this week, by the way. Um, an all time terrible show. And like normally every week, NXT is uh, it's totally fine. Like people are like, oh, it's boring. It's this. It's that. It's whatever. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. NXT is typically a very fine show every week. And then this week there was a baby face who kidnapped the heels friends, then threatened the heel with a baseball bat and threw cake and spaghetti on her until she agreed to a title match the next week. And there was another uh, baby face that stole a heels credit card (laughs) and basically promised to commit credit card fraud with it. Again, these are the, 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 the baby faces did these things to the heels on NXT this week. And uh, it was just another reminder that, Attitude Era, Dwayne Johnson and Steve Austin totally ruined this company forever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that whole that whole concept of the the good guy who acts like a like a just a mean, terrible person to everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, exactly, two people have been able to pull that off in their <laughs> in in the long storied history of professional wrestling, and uh, no one of that level of talent. And that's hardly an insult to anyone that's there. Uh, is is of that level of talent where they can overcome either the 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 lines they are meant to say or the things they are meant to do in their stories to uh, to connect with the crowd on that level. Yep. AEW this week had a big CM Punk versus MJF match. Took up a good portion of the second hour of Dynamite. Uh, what did you think of Dynamite this week? Uh, I really liked that match. I thought it was great. Um, pretty I, I really liked that kingston match so i don't know if i would say this is punk's best match since he came back it was more of a but that was definitely very different so this is i think as far as like a long form pro wrestling match i thought this was easily you know the best punk has looked it was really good and dramatic i didn't necessarily need that sec that like the first like the sleeper tease where mjf chokes him out with the tape doing a you know a randy savage spot which uh is great i like that spot but then having that reverse that only so he could cheat to win a second different way i thought maybe maybe we're getting a little too cute with that but um i guess maybe it was a way to to get to inject some some life so that the crowd didn't completely die in the middle part of that match but um yeah overall that was that was good um i i liked I, every time I see Pac wrestle on TV and there may be some outlying reasons that we're not privy to as to why he isn't on television every week, but like that guy should be wrestling more. Um, and then I think the number one thing that we'll talk about though, that everyone probably wanted to talk about other than yes, MJF did beat CM Punk in Chicago. <laughs> um, yeah. Is in fact uh, this Brandy segment, this weird, we just- before we touch on that, can we just touch uh-huh. on uh, the they are not paying off the Wardlow MJF thing yet? Yes, correct. Uh, I how do you feel about that? Because it feels like the crowd is real, real hot and bothered by Wardlow right now, and they're real ready <laughs> to see that man uh, become a big time baby face. And they think he's a they think he's a hunk. That's they right. Think he's they think he's hot. Who is hotter um, than I'm... Wardlow? JR asks every time he's out there. <laughs> Who is hotter in AEW than Wardlow? That's what the crowd wants to know. And uh, <laughs> and yeah, it just feels like we're kind of at a fever pitch. This has been a very, very slow build going back like pre-pandemic. They started teasing this ever so slightly. And we're two years in. The crowds are really responding well to him. But it doesn't seem like we're going for it right now. Yeah, I don't know what I would do there. I don't know what I would do there. Eventually, you you need to you need to pull the trigger. Um, I think the crowd is going to be more forgiving than a WWE crowd if you wait too long. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's okay. But yeah, for sure. 
I think, yeah, I think maybe that was the time to do it. And uh, if I'm CM Punk, I'm not losing to MJF uh, for my first loss, but I'm obviously not CM Punk and he knows what he's doing. So, <laughs> well, it, that is also interesting because we've talked about this a little bit before. There seems to be a certain aversion, with the exception of Serena D versus Hikaru Shida, there seems to be a real aversion to like immediate rematches in this company. Um, yes, which is not always a bad thing. Obviously, if if those are our only two choices, are the everybody wrestles the same person every week stylings of WWE or this, I would take this. But uh, like famously, the Cody Rhodes MJF thing, which was built up for a long time, they had one match. MJF cheated to win, and then they never touched. They never touched again. Like they never. <laughs> and other than maybe one or two mentions, they barely ever mentioned each other again. And you would think if you had this big grudge match that the heel cheated to win, that the next week the baby face needs to come out screaming fire and brimstone, demanding a rematch, right? Like. So, and obviously Puck's a pretty old school guy. So you wouldn't think he would do this, 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 and it wasn't clean. There was cheating and a run in and, and weapons used and all this stuff, but he did technically lose to him twice in one night. So you would think Punk being more of an old school guy would not do that if he did not plan on getting that, getting that uh, comeuppance sometime in not in the not too distant future. All right, so I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, this Brandy Dan Lambert segment. Dan, it was the Dan Lambert show, by the way. He was in multiple segments on Dynamite. <sighs> on, you know, if I didn't know better, I would think this is yet another COVID show. Could be, could be. Um, it's, it was but, just, yeah, yeah. Brandy Rose came out like <laughs> totally, total unannounced, uh, like not advertised for the show. And it was like after like a really hot opening segment that had uh, Brian Danielson teasing, starting a stable of like shooters with uh, John, John Moxley. <laughs> As someone which, on Twitter said, uh, he asked John Moxley, what if we got married? What if we got married and fell in <laughs> love and adopted three <laughs> wonderful sons? <laughs> uh, everybody was really jacked up and excited about that and then brandy rose came brandy rose came out started healing on the crowd in chicago she announced that she was in cleveland and um yeah i I guess and then dan lambert came out i just assume this is for roads to the top content Mm -hmm. and that none of it is advancing pro wrestling storylines but uh boy that was some uh that was some television i guess my thought is what what is the point here because dan lambert gets as much heat as anybody who talks on this show regularly like people sure. who love to boo this guy ideally you would say anyone associated with him is with him so that they also get some of that residual heat at least theoretically i wouldn't necessarily yes. say that's worked out you know super well for say ethan page and scorpio sky but hey You know, that's the idea. You can understand that. Um, But considering that he is like your most hated personality on the show, except for maybe Brandy Rhodes, why would you like, what is the point of these two entering into a verbal war of words? I would assume it's to lead to, as we we saw the return of Paige Van Zandt on on Dynamite this week. So we're going to do like Cody and Brandy against Ethan Page and and page van ethan page van zandt um actually it might be worth it just for the wordplay but like that that has a ring to it yes but like who is uh who is god all my best ideas just come when i'm not even thinking (laughs) Uh, but uh like but like who is that other than as you said maybe it's a some sort of plays into something on the reality show that we're not currently privy to uh what what is the crowd supposed to do with any of this they mostly boo Cody. They hate Brandy. They also hate Dan Lambert. So, like, <laughs> what are what are we doing? What are we doing here? And also, like, Brandy, like, see, like Cody is trying to do like a, you know, early 2010s John Cena character where he acknowledges that the fan that a large percentage of the fans boo him and don't like him, but he won't. But he's gonna keep to his his heroic ideals. 
which whatever fine let's go with that sure but, but brandy his his wife is <laughs> is playing like a, a discount stephanie mcmahon like talking about how she's you know she's in the position and oh if you're sick of me now you better get used to it because i'm in charge and i can do whatever i want in this company and all this stuff and she gets to kind of like stephanie she gets to drop lines that i bet a lot of other people in that company couldn't and it's, it's just at the end of it, it it just has this weird feeling of like again like some of the worst stuff in like 1999 wrestling like it's just no, nobody nobody ever gets their heat back on brandy either correct because like what does that lead to does brandy win one of the belts and then a baby fates beat brandy but again that's not the case because she's feuding with another heel right now so i just i don't i don't I don't understand what this is or why Cody is the, the noble, the noble hero character, or at least playing a hero in a way that annoys the crowd. Cause he's doing five D chess and he's secretly really a heel or whatever, whatever they're doing. His, right. his version of this currently does not match up with her version of being a heel. And so it's just Correct. weird and it doesn't work. And I do not know why you would pair them with your other like hot heel manager and talker in, in Lambert. I just, other than again, maybe it's, it's reality show stuff. And, and that's literally the only reason. And it'll make for some cute little sound bites they can cut up. Yes. That was my, that was my takeaway. I wasn't even thinking about this as a potential match down the road, but, uh, the uh, Paige Van Zant and somebody against Brandy and Cody or whatever. That makes that makes total sense. Paige Van Zant showing back up to answer the question. What if Elizabeth Banks had some tasteful <laughs> surgical enhancements and showed up in pro wrestling? I can't get over how much Paige Van Zant looks like El- Elizabeth Banks. It is uncanny. Uh, I saw so- <laughs> someone sent me a side by side of the two of them and it was like yeah they they could they could play sisters for sure yeah i wonder who did that (laughs) yeah that person sounds smart and handsome Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right well uh yeah okay so that's uh that's pro wrestling stuff this week um we still have smackdown to go this week we still have rampage to go this week although that's already been uh recorded and uh new japan uh they canceled all their shows for the rest of january because covid Mm-hmm. So uh, they have not returned to action yet, but uh, that's coming up. And uh, all right, so that, I think that's uh, that's mostly the pro wrestling news. WWE did their uh, earnings call on Thursday this week, and uh, they brought in both the most revenue they've ever brought in in a year and the most profit they've ever brought in in a year before in 2021. So some people are getting fired tomorrow. Or probably Maybe are tomorrow. being fired as we're recording this. Yeah, I'm I'm constantly checking my phone because every time we record this show on a Thursday night after an earnings call, like people get fired, but they haven't announced any yet. And I'm uh, thinking maybe somebody told me maybe after WrestleMania is the next round. Mm. But <laughs> that was the tradition when it didn't used to happen like eight times a year. That was right. the traditional like once a year Black Friday. Right. Yeah, it was the uh, after the uh, after the earnings call in April. But yeah, so maybe that's maybe that's next up. But that's uh, that's pro wrestling news this week, everybody. And uh, anything else you want to get into here? No, I think that that about covers it. There's uh, like it's still it's still WrestleMania season. I, I will just say we kind of touched on it briefly. I find it very fascinating that Lita is doing the Saudi show um, because yeah. she very mm-hmm. publicly. <laughs> And to her credit, she didn't say, like, how dare they go? She specifically took issue with how they framed their going. Right. Um, they were her her comments, uh, because this is part of, like, why I admired. Developed an admiration for Lita as a human being as well, was I mean, like not, her as willingness admi- to- not as much admiration as you have for certain other women. But <sighs> as you told her that one time, I accidentally insulted Lita to her face the only time I met her. Who among us hasn't made a verbal gaffe? Could you answer me that? <laughs> oh, yes, Sister Roberta. I was just speaking in generalities. <laughs> yeah, but her whole thing was like, look, you're a corporation. You're going to you're going to Saudi Saudi Arabia to make money. 
but don't try to frame it as like you're going to, for, to make this a women's empowerment thing because it's not about women's empowerment because they don't treat women equally. It's about uh, making as much money as you can. And right. now, obviously, Lita is now making as much money as she can <laughs> by coming back and doing a Saudi Arabia show. And like, look, somebody put six figures in front of me. I don't know that she's making six figures for the show, but educated guests, she's making at least six figures for this show. Somebody put six figures in front of me. I would like to hope and think I would have morals, but I don't know. Yeah. Like I, I, I yeah, it, it's a very weird thing. And yeah, maybe I would be harder on her if it wasn't, if she wasn't a very likable person, <laughs> like you, you just don't know. Like there's thing, there's a lot of variables to this, this scenario. And like I said, she didn't, she didn't criticize them for going at all. She specifically criticized their, their framing of it. And the fact that, the you know the Saudi government uses events like this to run cover for how terrible their human rights record is, specifically when it comes to women. You know, if if like she said, like money money talks, and yeah, at the very least, I hope she's she's getting a big payday. But yeah, it would be interesting if if after she goes, if she if she does an interview anywhere or a podcast appearance or something, and someone just asks her. Her thoughts on all of that. I would I would be interested to hear what she had to say. Yep. All right. Well, uh, sounds good, everybody. Till next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Old Amy third place. Ugh. I only have to I only have to live that down about mm, three times a week. That's fine. <laughs> Just yeah, that that's the the meme of uh, Andy Bernard on the office in his car screaming, I wanted that to go better. <laughs> yes. When I say setting up, it means I'm going downstairs and getting a Coke energy out of the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> that's what setting up my computer means. <laughs> what kid? It takes about 11 seconds to like <laughs> plug in a microphone and turn a computer on <laughs> these days. So there you go. Yeah. So I'm talking to Renee Paquette tomorrow morning. Am I allowed to leave this in or you want to? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it's a secret, but uh, I'm, yeah, I don't necessarily want to talk about details, but uh, yeah, but you're, ha- uh, you're you wanna... having a chat with your friend Renee tomorrow. Yeah, I'm talking to Renee tomorrow morning. So that's uh that could be fun. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a, it could be a very interesting uh, interesting time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just just a normal normal dude having a normal life. Nothing <laughs> nothing absolutely insane to see here. That's right. I mean, you're just you're just living that Dwayne Johnson dad rap life. <laughs> it's all about drive and power. Stay hungry, <laughs> devour. Yeah, and boost to asses, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm, I mean, mm-hmm. that's what we do here. That's right. And we that's film we videos for Ken Shamrock <laughs> and Joseph Biden at the same time in the same outfit. Yes. That's all part of the Dwayne Johnson lifestyle. Ignoring Survivor Series that was built <laughs> around you. Part of the Dwayne Johnson lifestyle. Right. But mostly the drive and power and, and boost to <laughs> asses. Yes, absolutely. I will say just... With regards to my uh, my my meeting with Renee tomorrow, mm-hmm. ladies and gentlemen, if you quit your job and you watch Frasier on the Hallmark Channel every <laughs> night for a year and a half, you too can be a champion. <laughs> Nothing is impossible. What a, right. what a dumb life I have. <laughs> <laughs> this is isn't that just what life is for most most people that end up with any form of success. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I guess either you're related to somebody who was already successful or right. you just do weird, dumb <laughs> things. And eventually somebody notices. <laughs>
Yeah, I think that's yeah. Yeah, there's very few people where it's like a linear, okay, you do this and then you do this and then you do this and then you achieve something. There's no school that is going to teach you <laughs> how to watch Frasier every night for a year straight on the Hallmark channel. Yeah. Except when it's uh, interrupted by Countdown to Christmas. <laughs> uh, unacceptable. Yeah. yeah. I don't care how many Erica Durant's as best friend of lead actress movies. <laughs> Hallmark puts on. It's not worth interrupting the Frasier. Yeah. I did not see that career path for Trish Stratus coming, but it's here. She did. She was the like the the friend in a movie last year, and now she's the lead in a movie in a Christmas movie this year. Is it specifically for Hallmark or is it for like Canadian Hallmark? No. Well, it it's probably for like Canadian Hallmark and then like her one here this year got picked up by uh, the Fox streaming service and mm-hmm. up TV. There you go. So it, that was like the uh, Erica Durant's path two or three years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I feel like she's probably a good two years from being the friend in the Hallmark movies. There you go. You got to build the, uh, got to build the repertoire to just show that you have the, the skill set to. <laughs> yes to play someone's friend in a, in a Christmas romantic comedy. Yes. By the way, I'm now one step closer to my, what has been my, my goal for the last two years, which is to host a, a podcast with Trish Stratus and, <laughs> and take it and take it touring around the country. There you go. I mean, there's, there's somebody's going to do that with her at some point. <laughs> There's no reason it couldn't be you other than some of the reasons that it currently can't be. (laughs) (laughs) There's no reason other than every reason. (laughs) All right. Got, had a nice dinner and and cake and got some, some, uh, some presents and yeah, Hmm. I got a pair of white Puma shoes. (laughs) (laughs) They were gifts. They're nice. Like, they're really nice shoes. I was going to say, okay, how do you feel about these? Yeah, I mean, like, it's one of those things where they're, like, they're a little louder than I would maybe have picked out for myself. I do really like them, and they have black uh, soles, which I like because Ah. my uh, my entire life of every time I've owned white shoes, it's, like, three seconds into me having them. They are are stained, so I feel like if you have the black on the bottom, that's at least preventing... It's giving you a little bit of a barrier. Yes. So, uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the other thing about it. Like, oh, you have a really nice pair of tennis. Like, I've never been like a sneaker guy. Like, I, I respect it. And like, I see <laughs> why that's fun for people. Yes. Because I, you know, but also it's like the second you have them, we, it, I get that feeling of like, well, I can't wear these ever because they won't, <laughs> they won't look like this if I do. <laughs> right. So that's, uh, that's probably the most interesting <laughs> interesting gift i received right so if it's like oh this is a for the people who are like really into the nikes it's like okay these are 500 hundred dollar shoes do i wear them or do i display them <laughs> mm-hmm. and then yes i avoid buying white sold shoes for the reason you just described because i don't have the patience to like scrub or take care of them after they get stained the first time and then it's just like oh you just got a dirty pair of <laughs> Mm-hmm. White sole tennis shoes forever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I try to keep on keeping on.